Good afternoon, and welcome to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. I'm Diana Craig Patch. I'm an associate curator in the Department of Egyptian Art, and I'm very happy to see you all today. I want to say Happy Mother's Day to those in the audience, and I appreciate you joining us this afternoon. Uh, I do want to draw your attention to the dawn of Egyptian art. It will be the subject of the presentations today, this early material from ancient Egypt. I'm hoping some of you have already been down to the exhibition downstairs, and if you haven't, perhaps after this is concluded, you will be motivated to go and see some really amazing pieces um, that are both from the collection at the Metropolitan Museum as well from 11 other lenders. Uh, which have given us the chance to share some amazing pieces of early art. I'd like to start out the um, presentation today with a very, very brief um, run-through for you, setting the stage for this material that Stan Hendricks and Renee Friedman are going to talk about. As all of you are very familiar, I'm sure, with the great icons of ancient Egypt pyramids, large sculpture, such as you see in the slide in front of you. But many of you may not be so familiar with some of these other pieces. These date to the pre-dynastic and early dynastic periods. This is what comes before the pyramids. And it is in this period of about 1,500 years that Egypt evolves from a series of tiny villages, maybe based largely on a little farming and some hunting, into larger villages, elaborate, um, some elaborate burials, and even to the point, perhaps, of a single large town at Heracopolis. And by the end of the pre-dynastic period, we clearly have people that are, have a sense of power and social status and control large areas of the country. And at the end of the pre-dynastic period, we have people that probably can even be considered kings. Just to give you a bit of an idea of the chronology, we're talking about five to 6,000 years ago. And it's amazing we have even some of these pieces because it is really a long time ago. And much of the art is made from pottery, bone, ivory, and some stone. To draw your attention to the pre-dynastic period, you can see that it's divided into a series of stages. The earliest are these two here. This is in the Delta area, and these are all in Upper Egypt, that is, in the southern part of the country. The names are taken from sites, and it is at the end of Nagata III that we draw a line, and we have the beginning of Dynasty I, which is where the first pharaohs of Egypt, the first recognized pharaohs of Egypt, begin, with Aha at 3100. Narmer, many of you may be very familiar with the name, the Narmer palette, he's the last king of the pre-dynastic period, following the chronology we use here. Just to remind you, in ancient Egypt, the area of land we're talking about is this Blue River, and green on either side, with a little bit of desert. Most of this area was considered foreign lands to the Egyptians, and they only entered it when they had to for certain purposes. The valley, which is centered, the Nile is the center part of the valley. On either side, it has green fertile area, the land, the floodplain, and bordering that is what's called the low desert, which rises up into cliffs. This is the area in which the ancient Egyptians lived and the area that we are going to be looking at today. The river, of course, is very important to the ancient Egyptians. They used it to travel up and down their country because it went right through from all the way to the Mediterranean. It was the source of flooding every year that spilled over onto the floodplain and allowed them to have very good crop yield every year. It allowed them to support herds of sheep and goat and cattle. There were areas that were very swampy, such as this papyrus swamp you see here. But on either side of this very fertile area was the desert. And this was a very harsh area, and it was an area that the Pharaonic Egyptians were afraid of and worried about because it was largely desert. But in pre-dynastic times, I have to point out to you that it is not quite as dry as we see today in, ancient, in modern Egypt or through most of the pharaonic period. 
During the pre-dynastic period, there was more water, there was more rain, and it collected in areas that allowed for trees and shrubbery and more animals to live in this desert, animals that are long gone from ancient Egypt, like large antelope, giraffe, elephant, lions, leopards, and these are the focus of much of the talks today. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Stan Hendricks. Stan received his PhD in 1989 from Catholic University in Leuven, Belgium. He is currently a lecturer in the history of art at the Media, Arts, and Design faculty of Hasselt University, also in Belgium. Since 1977, he has participated in excavations and surveys at El Kab, Adaima, Magar Dendera, Deir al Barsha, Heracompolis, Abu Balas Trail, the Khufu region, and the Komambo and Aswan survey. In addition to his being a master at the analysis of ancient Egyptian ceramics, his research focuses on the pre dynastic period, up to the end of the Old Kingdom. He has published extensively and edits the analytical bi bibliography of the prehistory and early dynastic period of Egypt and northern Sudan, which he updates yearly in Archeo Neil. Stan is going to present Hunting in Pre-Dynastic Egypt. I'm delighted to welcome Stan Hendricks. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me, and especially thank you very much for putting up this really very nice show. I have never seen these objects presented so beautifully, as you can see them, as you can see them here. And I'm of course very pleased to see all of to see all of you. Hunting in pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, this will be the only table I will show this afternoon. I assure you. And if you see what is in green, you can see that hunting for wild animals in Egypt is hardly of any economic importance during the fourth millennium uh, B BC. Um, and that's logical because this is, uh, the economy is based on uh, agriculture, on animal husbandry, and definitely not on hunting. Only in the... This should... Oh. Uh, only in the very earliest uh, period, uh, hunting is still of some importance. And then there is one exception, and this one exception is from Hierocompolis, and I will come uh, back to that, where you have about 15% of wild animal uh, remains um, in the whole of the archaeological material. Um, now, when we look at the representations, uh, we get a completely different picture because there there are many uh, hunting scenes such as for example on the hunter's palette which you can see on display here where hunting is the basic theme uh, this is this dates to the end of the pre-dynastic period but if we get to a much earlier period to nagada one period uh, we have already hunting scenes on this uh, palette which is now uh, which is now in stockholm and here we have both hippopotamus hunting and apparently a hunting scene with a dog on a, de on a desert animal uh, this is another object here on the, in the exhibition uh, where you have uh, somebody again hunting a hippopotamus uh, with a um, device that is, probably, that is represented here um, and which will have looked like this. This is a spear attached to a floater and the image represented is that of the floater. So, as in many hunting scenes um, uh, from pre-dynastic Egypt, the actual hunter, as the man, is not represented, but it's the hunting devices, or as we will see for the desert hunt, it will be, it will be the dogs. Mm. Uh, there are quite, there's quite a number of the so-called white cross-lined jars. These are jars with a white decoration on a red background, and they are typical for the Nagada One, for the Nagada One period. Mm. Um, and the importance of this hippopotamus representations is it's, it's so much, it's so important that I am absolutely convinced that even when you have the individual hippopotamus without a hunter, without the hunting devices, it still refers to the same concept of hunting, of hunting hippopotamus. And these are just a number of the examples I'm showing, such as on this jar in Lyon, where the decoration is almost entirely gone, but where we could uh, restorate it in, uh, do the restoration in drawing. Now, uh, taking, uh, starting from there, 
Uh, there are a number of really exceptional objects. Uh, this is a tomb that was excavated by the German Archaeological Institute about 15 years ago, and uh, from it are two really extraordinary jars, which, uh, which will come up both in my talk, but here's the first one. And in the lower part, we have again a hippopotamus hunt. Um, and the hippopotamus are even represented as pregnant in these images. But the combination with the scene above is of great interest. Because above, we have a large central person holding a mace head. And attached to, um, uh, behind them, are prisoners which are bound by their neck and which have rather bewildered hair. Now, there is a very good parallel. This does not work as I would, yeah. Um, there's a very good parallel for this, for this scene, which comes from a tomb in which this figurine is found. And I indicated it for your convenience. Uh, this hippopotamus has been hit at the back of the head. There is an incision in this figurine. But from the same tomb comes this jar. And it seems that we have the same idea of a combination of a hippopotamus hunt and a scene which is, which we have the jar here, but we, what we really need is the drawing of this jar, which is to be accepted as a victory scene. We have again uh, tall people holding very large mace heads, and in front of them and below them are people with their arms um, tied behind their back, and there are even pregnant women among, among them. This is obvious about domination of persons, and there is a clear parallel in, for example, this little maze head from Hyra Companies, where you have rows of prisoners bound, bound together. Uh, to be absolutely sure, the white cross-lined jar will date to about 3700 BC. This here will date to about 3000 BC. But it's the same idea, but over a very long, over a very long time. Also on display here is a jar that comes from the museum in Brussels, and which is one of the earliest known examples of this type of, of this type of vessels. And if I um, indicate a few things, the large persons have their arms raised, and in my opinion, and definitely in this jar, in this jar, raising your arms is a victory symbol. It is as when Lance Armstrong was winning the Tour de France years ago. Yeah? It's the same kind of attitude. You make yourself bigger. The prisoners are attached by ropes to the arms of the central, of the central person. Uh, the, the edge of the shoulders indicates that the arms are to be considered as bound behind the back. And finally, there's the hairstyle. The hair looks like as they are chaotic. They are in deep problems, and this is all in all. These are the very earliest indications of violence in Egypt with a political and probably also with a military meaning. Uh, this can be seen as the very beginning of what much later will end up in the unification of, uh, of Egypt. Now, on white coastline pottery, there is quite a number of these uh, hippopotamus hunting scenes. On the decorated pottery, which is a category of pottery characteristic for the Nagada II period, there are far less examples, but that is to a large extent uh, the result of the selection of media, and apparently it was not that much drawn on pottery at that moment. But there are a few hippopotamus-shaped vessels on which the spears and the hunters are definitely, um, uh, are definitely to, be, to be recognized. And when we go into the early dynastic period, that means that we have done from the White Cross Line vessels to here about seven or 800 years, there are seal impressions. And in the seal impression, there is the king who is killing the hippopotamus, and that's another representation on a seal impression. These come from the royal tombs at Abydos, so these are very directly linked with the kings them, themselves. A few years ago, um, at the German excavations at Abydos, uh, this very small and very fragmentary seal impression has been found, and here is the reconstruction of the drawing. You have the king with the spear and with the float for the hippopotamus hunt, 
but this is to be placed somewhere there, but the seal is incomplete. This time he is not dominating hippopotami, but he is dominating decapitated prisoners, and the prisoners have their heads lying between their legs. You may say that's rather small, uh, for, and that's the parallel with the hippopotamus hunt. You may find that the heads are rather small, but if we take a detail from the Narmer palette, it is obvious that this indeed is what is, what is being shown. So hippopotamus hunt is very directly linked to political power and to the pharaonic power and to what the king means. The king controls the hippopotamus as he controls his enemies. And that's the basic point behind this idea of hunting because the hippopotamus hunt will have had very little economic importance, but apparently has a huge symbolic importance in control over the chaos that the hippopotamus, which is a very aggressive animal, uh, may represent. So what we can do is this. We can go from the Nagada I period to the Nagada II period to Nagada III, which is early dynastic, but on the right-hand side, top and below, that's the Temple of Edfu. And the Temple of Edfu dates to the very end of the Egyptian period. So between what we have there and here is almost 4,000 years. But over these 4,000 years, you have the continuous idea of the hippopotamus hunt having a very important um, symbolic, uh, symbolic meaning. Now, it's not only the hippopotamus that is being hunted in the Nilotic environment. Uh, we also have the crocodile hunt. And crocodiles, apparently, are being captured uh, with nets. And uh, this is another object from the um, uh, exhibition uh, here. Uh, there are more of these, and it's again a whole series. Uh, the hippopotamus apparently is another element of these chaotic forces to be controlled, and hippopotamus hunt definitely has no direct economic uh, relevance. Mm. Uh, for the Nagara II period on the decorated pottery, uh, we have also a, a number of examples, and as you may uh, have noticed already, it's uh, very often again without the hunters being represented themselves. It is the spears that do the work by itself. Now we can find um, uh, representations of, for example, crocodile hunt, sometimes really far away from the Nile Valley. This is a rock drawing in the Wadi Baramiya, and you can see where the Wadi Baramiya is located. This is at about, I think, 60 or 70 kilometers where this exact drawing is from the Nile. There is no crocodile to be found in a very far uh, neighborhood. Uh, representing, drawing these uh, scenes with uh, other um, uh, hunting scenes at a place so remote from where it actually took place, uh, clearly indicates that this has nothing to do with hunting magic or with um, uh, detail of, details of actual events, uh, little narratives that would have taken place at the site, because it definitely was not at the site. It indirectly confirms the symbolic importance of these scenes. Now that's one type of hunt. That's the hunt in the Nilotic environment. Let's now turn to the low desert. In the low desert, a lot of hunting must have taken place, but again, uh, again, not with a real economic importance. And here we have the second vessel from this one tomb by the Bidus, which I've already shown. Now we have a number of prisoners, but without the dominating human person, um, uh, as it is on the other jar. But we now have a dog, and the dog is behind some desert animals, but also behind or below a number of hippopotami. Uh, again, this has nothing to do with a realistic narrative. It is the idea of the dog that controls all of this. And the dog is the replacement of the hunter, and the hunter is the ultimate elite uh, group of Egypt at that moment. Um, there are more examples for this, such as this nice jar in, in Brussels, uh, where you have a whole series of different desert animals, and then two dogs, and the colors of the dogs, uh, the, the colors the dogs are wearing, clearly refer to their masters, to the actual, to the actual hunters. Uh, there is one a very nice um, uh, representation on this bowl where you can actually see the hunter with his arrows and bow and with his dogs. 
And please note the little things the dogs are having below their necks. Uh, there are several interpretations possible, but I will accept here that they are um, uh, knots which, to which the leashes of these dogs are, uh, are tied to. For the Nagada uh, two period, we have a few um, hunting scenes in the desert, such as these. And the importance of dogs is anyhow obvious in Egypt. There are several burials of, uh, of dogs, and even with pottery, uh, these animals were of relevance. Now, for the, uh, to have a better look of what hunting in this period means, we have to go to a very famous um, uh, um, element of pre-dynastic Egypt, that's the so-called decorated tomb as Hierakom at Hierakompolis, discovered at the end of the 19th century, where you have this large painted, uh, painted scene. And uh, one of the desert of the hunting techniques is by chasing dogs behind these wild animals. So uh, the, it is kind of, well, tempting to consider this as a little detail of somebody sending off his dogs. But I think you, can, you should not do that, because there are no little narratives in these, uh, in these uh, representations. These representations work with iconographic, you can almost say emblems, as it would be for much more recent, for much more recent painting. And this is the idea of the power again, as we have the raised arms in the um, victory scenes. Mm. Other techniques of hunting are on the left this time, are with traps. Mm. But we can have, and I can have the images uh, speaking for themselves, you can compare these representations between hunting and military um, uh, um, IDs. Mm. And what a particular image uh, are these animals around this circular thing, but the circular object is to be considered uh, this kind of spiked trap. So the trap is worked into, uh, you cannot see it, it's worked into the, into the sand, the animal will walk into it and the animal cannot walk very far any, any longer, and there is quite some representations of traps like, uh, like this. What you actually do in the desert when you go and hunt is you don't kill animals, you capture animals. Already for a very simple reason, if you kill them, you have, will have to carry them. If you capture them, they can walk themselves out of, the, out of the desert, which is a lot easier, of course. So there's a lot of lassoing going on to capture animals, and we have it on the Hierocompolis um, painting, but we have it in an enormous amount of rock art representations of which you can see just a few here. Um, remarkably, neither on the pottery nor on the very, very frequent uh, rock art images are animals actually being killed. Uh, at the very most, somebody is holding his arrow and pointing at it. And these are the only two clear examples I know about among uh, literally hundreds of rock art drawings. So it's capturing animals, that's the important thing. And we have the representations of this on this white cross-lined jar where you can see the animals being brought in, but perhaps the drawing is more easy to recognize than the, um, than the actual photo. And this previous vessel goes together with this one, and here you have the, uh, the, the um, animals lined up. And here you have another example from a rock art representation. And I think that these vessels show exactly the same idea, somebody dominating a row of these animals. And these are not domestic animals, these are white animals, of course. And whether the, uh, the human, uh, the hunter is there or he isn't, I think it's the same idea. And I think the idea is also on this extremely nice uh, knife from, uh, from, up, from Upper Egypt, where at the end of some of the rows, you have the dogs. The dogs control the animals in front of them, but the hunter is nowhere to be seen. And you have it also, and both of the objects are on display on the exhibition. You also have it in this very nice, very tiny um, uh, object. So it's about controlling and ordering the chaotic world that you have in the desert. And then you have, of course, yeah, to line it up. And here I think this is the same idea. 
and also on this vessel. But here it gets into a far more complex kind of scenes with boats, with human representations, which I, not, which I will not go into, but which are to be seen as uh, scenes with, yeah, let's say, a religious um, uh, relevance. Mm. And there, was, there are a few jars, they're, only, they're, they're very exceptional, where you have these strange looking things in between these animals. And I think these refer to where the animals are to be brought, because we can very easily make a comparison. Something went wrong. Um, where we have it also on this, uh, on this vessel. It's the same kind of drawing, and what you have to do is this. This is a building. They are bringing these animals to a particular place. This is a typical manner of the Egyptian of representing what will be called in the funerary archaeology a false door, but here actually it is just a door into, into a building, and you will see the actual buildings, but I will not, prese uh, I will not present them to you. Uh, René Friedman will do it. And also from René Friedman's work mainly are his excavations at this site at Heracompolis, which is a large oval courtyard. And in the trash pits outside of this oval courtyard, that's where this exceptional faunal assemblage comes from, where you have about 15% of wild animals. Here, these animals have been brought. Here, they have been slaughtered at the right moment and the right occasion, and the right occasion will have been particularly important religious, socio-religious uh, feasts. This is a detail of, the, uh, this is the main image of this court, and the entrance which is on your right hand side, and which must have been very massive. And I'm not saying that this is exactly this place, but the Narma Mace Head uh, was found at Heracompolis, at only a few hundred meters from where this oval court is and we have the representation of an oval court with wild animals in it in a royal ceremony which you have on your, uh, on your left. So what I think is that happened, you catch the animals, you bring them to the valley, you bring them to a particular place, and the particular place is, for example, uh, this site at uh, this site at Hierocompolis. The um, hippopotamus hunt is a different thing. The hippopotamus hunt is about killing, destroying the, hippopot the hippopotamus. Mm? So that's not, these, that's not this story. Now we have an idea about the actual hunter, hunting parties. Here you have the hunters mm? surrounding uh, a, a whole number of wild animals. But on top of the hunter's palette is this building. And next to this building is an animal that doesn't exist, a double, a double bull. But we know that this double bull is also an emblem. So the double bull must identify the building and places the whole of the hunting scene on the hunter's palette into a religious context. The hunters themselves are also very remarkable. They are wearing tails at the back of their, um, uh, of their skirt. And the tails, there is a bunch of them. Uh, you can find these tails on these animals, uh, and we may perhaps already have them, but the details are not sufficient, on these abiders jars, which we have seen before. Now this animal, we know this animal, this animal occurs on several of the late pre-dynastic palettes. This animal is the, the, the Lycaon pictus, the, I had to say it like that, uh, yes, I say it correctly. It's the African wild hunting dog, it's not a dog, it's a, a species by itself. This is an extremely uh, well-organized hunter, hunts in packs and attacks from both sides on its, uh, on its prey. Uh, they are very, very, or they're very organized and apparently the Egyptian hunter compared himself with the hunting of these, of, uh, of, of these animals. Uh, you have some images of them, uh, of the, of them here. Um, uh, and the um, uh, composition of the hunter's palette is paralleled by the way in which the Lycaon pictus dominates on other, on other palettes. There is, a clear pa there is a clear parallelism. And we also have other hunting um, uh, groups. Here it comes from a rock art panel, and the things in red are more probably ropes to capture animals. And the dogs are in blue, while in um, green is a Barbary sheep, as you have it also on this vessel, 
and as we have it on a number of other objects. And these hunters are here in a machine that comes from the same place. They have decorations, tattoos or decorations on their clothes with hippopotamus hunt. So it is linked. Desert hunt and hippopotamus hunt are linked to, are linked to each other and this is a detail of, um, of this. Now, to show you the real impact of these uh, hunting scenes, we have to go into the Western Desert. Here you are at several hundred kilometers from the Nile Valley, um, even east of the Dakhla Oasis, and this comes from the work of the University of Cologne, uh, Cologne in which I participated. And at some place, there is this very isolated, but very notable rock. And on this rock are several panels with drawings. Uh, which are being copied here, and the result of this work, well, you have it here. Mm. This is Barbary sheep hunting and or oryx hunting. These are the biggest animals which you can find in the, um, uh, in the desert, and apparently they went a very long way to go after them. Uh, now, the, draw the date of these drawings are difficult, but I draw your attention to the knot, a uh, uh, knot at the back of the dogs, which we have seen before, and for example, uh, below or above the neck of the dog on these two, um, on these two documents. Now, the um, uh, Western Desert drawings are not pre-dynastic. They are early dynastic at the very earliest, and they more probably date to the very beginning of the old, uh, of the old kingdom. Uh, oh. I missed one there. I tried to uh, show that Barbary sheep hunting is a very popular theme, again, on the uh, white cross line vessels. There's another place, also in the Western Desert, not far from the previous one, uh, where there's a shelter. In the shelter, there's an isolated block, which is now uh, brought to a magazine. We have a falcon, and the falcon will help us to date this, because the position of the falcon with that kind of tail, you only find it from about the middle of the first dynasty onwards, so it has to be more recent and is um, early dynastic or early in the, old, in the old kingdom. But what is of interest to us is that again, there is the hunting of Barbary sheep, but there are two very yeah, strange devices, but these strange devices, we can also find them and the Hierocompolis painting. And I don't know what they exactly mean, but you have these little knobs of them, and they must be traps of some kind, but at a very remote place in the desert. I'm coming back to the Nile Valley. Uh, here we are in the extreme south of Egypt, next to Aswan, uh, where some important work is going on during the last few years. And in this place, there is what is to be accepted as the earliest um, extensively uh, represent, uh, royal representation of Egypt, dating to about 3,100 BC. Mm. Um, unfortunately, it is very battered up recently. This is an old photograph, mm. and here you have the detail, but there you have the two details, and on the left it is unfortunately as it looks, as it looks today. And these are the earliest representations we know for um, uh, a king in, uh, um, with the, wearing the white crown. And he's still accompanied by a dog. The dog is still important of that moment. He's not just a little pet dog walking around. He is walking in front of the dog. The dog is the symbol. The dog is still the symbol as it was in pre-dynastic times, but it will no longer be like that in, um, uh, in dynastic times. And close to the main scene which you have there, there is an extremely a beaten up part, but which has nevertheless been possible to, uh, to draw. And what we draw there is on top is a hunting scene with somebody holding a bow and arrows. And, arrows. and as you can see, and this talks again for itself, it starts over there in, this, let's say, 3700 to 800 BC. And here we are in the Sixth Dynasty. Here there is about 1,500 years between these two representations, but it continues throughout, and there are more examples to be, to, to be given. So hunting here ends up in the royal representations of the early dynastic period. And it's clear that the king is not hunting for his subsistence, but that this actually is about the power that it represents. And we can find that still on the famous Narmer palette where these two mythological animals, which are the utmost idea of chaotic forces, 
are being controlled. And on the other side of the um, Nama palette, you have perhaps the most um, iconic uh, representation of royal power, the king smashing his, smashing his enemies. So in conclusion, uh, what I would like to, to say is that on this jar from Abydos, which is centuries earlier than the Nama palette, we already have the same ID and the same combinations. Military power, in combination with hunting, and the one thing I didn't mention when we were looking at this Abydos jar first, because I know we would come back to it, is the bull. And the bull is, during pharaonic times, a very well-known royal symbol. Now, I'm not saying that this is already a king over there, but it's definitely the idea of power. And so the bull is not just hanging around while the hippopotamus hunt is going on, First of all, a bull has nothing to do in a place where a hippopotamus hunt is going on, but the bull in is the essential animal, as should in the, is in reality the central element of this hippopotamus hunt. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stan, for that great lecture on early pre-dynastic hunting. There was all sorts of things that I hadn't seen before or thought about, and so it was very interesting to hear that. I'd like to now introduce um, to you today Dr. Renee Friedman. She is a graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, in Egyptian archaeology, and has worked at many sites throughout Egypt since 1980. With special interest in the pre-dynastic, Egypt's formative period, as you know now. In 1983, she joined the team working at Heracompolis, a huge early site in southern Egypt. And she went on to become the director of the Heracompolis expedition in 1996, a title she still holds. Currently the Hege Research Curator of Early Egypt at the British Museum, she is the author of many scholarly and popular publications all about about all aspects of the site of Heracompolis. Today she's going to speak to you about the master of the animals exploring Egypt's first zoo. Renee? Thank you, it's uh, wonderful to be here this afternoon and tell you to tell you a little bit about our work at the site of Heracompolis. We just finished our season six weeks ago, so you're going to have the benefit of breaking news. So as um, Stan has already shown you, um, the animal-based iconography of the pre-dynastic period, with its stress on hunting and the control of animals, had an important ritual and increasingly political significance for the elite in this formative period of Egypt the Egyptian state. Um, that this imagery is derived from the actual manipulation of real animals is nowhere made more clear than at Hierocopolis one of the power centers at this time, and no doubt one of the largest, with settlement remains, excuse me, settlement remains spreading over the low desert for a distance of about two miles. Now Stan has already discussed or shown you the early temple at the site. Uh, where, everybody okay? <laughs> okay? So Stan has already shown you um, the early temple at the site where quantities of animals both domestic and wild were sacrificed in rites probably associated with the coming of the Nile flood um, to control its potential chaos and to ensure the rebirth of the land. But this is not the only place where animals, and especially wild animals, played a role. In the exclusive cemetery of the elite, located up the wadi, animals were again used, not only to ensure the rebirth of the local rulers, but also to proclaim their power in this life and the next. Now in its time, this cemetery must have been amazing. At its center stood a precinct of wooden structures, which took the form of multi-columned, multi or better known what we call architecturally hypostyle halls. And this is the earliest evidence for above ground funerary architecture in Egypt. And as Egypt's earliest funerary temples, oops, as Egypt's earliest funerary temples, we can potentially, uh, can we get it to run? 
Hello. Is there anybody here? Okay, there we go. We can potentially, if not too fancifully, reconstruct them like this. Made out of wood, hanging with mats, um, surrounded with color. And these provide us with a glimpse at an elaborate mortuary landscape previously unsuspected for this time. Now that the imagery of the hunt was important in the rituals undertaken in these structures is made clear by the beautiful objects we found within them. We have wonderfully crafted knives, arrowheads, and animals masterfully created out of flint and ivory, um, amongst many other things, specialized pottery, handles for mace heads, etc. But all of these relate to power and the hunt. And, but these are ex certainly exquisite objects, to be sure. But for the actual burials of the elite, as we now know, only the real thing would do. And this we've learned from the excavation of the large and rich tomb we call Tomb 16, which dates to the early Nagata II period, so about 3650 BC. Now, although a brick-lined tomb was inserted into it about 500 years later, probably as a pious act of renovation, it was still possible to determine the original, rather sizable dimensions of the tomb, and also get some measure of its original wealth. Despite its plundering and reuse, it was still a very rich tomb, containing a huge amount of pottery. Over 115 vessels have been recorded from it, including one incised with the earliest known um, image of the goddess Bat, who will later be replaced by Hathor as um, one of the chief cow goddesses of Egypt. Two of the best preserved um, ceramic funerary masks known exclusively from the cemetery almost certainly come from this tomb. And you'll see the cast of this one. Whoops. I'm having a very hard time here. I've done something. Um, anyway, a cast of, I don't know what's, Hello. Okay. A cast of the mask is um, on uh, display downstairs. Where you can see it. <laughs> because you can't see it here right now, unfortunately. I don't know. Okay. So we have this very rich tomb that I'm going to show you as soon as I can. And it had um, many interesting things with it, <laughs> which I can describe to you, but it might be easier if we can actually see it. Be delighted to. Sure. How wide is the Delta floodplain? How wide is the Delta floodplain? Whenever the Nile flooded, how far did it flood? How 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 large was the Nile floodplain? Yes. In different parts of Egypt, of course, it's different sizes depending on how far it can how close the valley comes in. So um, in Upper Egypt, uh, you can have up to 10 kilometers, 10 miles of floodplain if, if it's low enough. In the area around Hierakompolis, the floodplain was about four kilometers wide, so about three miles. So you're talking about a substantial area that was underwater. All right, so returning. So if we go back, there's our masks. So we have lots of pots in this big tomb and we have funerary masks, and we'd like to compare it now to this is what, what most burials looked like at this period. You had mat covering with some pots in a pit, only large enough to, cover, to, to fit the body in. So this gives you some idea of the wealth and effort that has gone into tomb 16. But the fine grave goods were only one part of the funerary arrangements made for its owner. Not, cont not content to hide his glory underground, a number of wooden post holes 
excuse me, a number of post holes um, contained wooden posts, which indicate, um, there we go, there we go. We have a number of posts that actually were preserved. We have the wood preserved, and they indicate a substantial superstructure was raised above the tomb, possibly something like the reconstruction, while the post holes along the north side indicate that an offering chapel of at least six posts was appended to it. And then surrounding it all was a fence which interconnected with a wider complex of enclosures containing a range of smaller tombs. And altogether, this created a complex that we can tentatively reconstruct like this, possibly imitating the owner's earthly residence with household members holding their same place in death as they did in life. And this is because certainly the arrangement seems to be far from arbitrary. The inner rung of tombs flanking the central tomb were reserved for human burials, while the graves of animals and possibly their keepers formed an outer perimeter, attesting to an extensive menagerie of animals, both domestic and wild. Now, as for the tombs of the inner rung, the post demarcating the, um, the area is um, particularly clear and the fine artifacts and here and in all of the human tombs indicate high status owners, presumably family and courtiers. But amongst them, um, the most favored seems to have been a male iconoplastic dwarf. Now, endochondoplasia is a genetic mutation that affects the growth of cartilage and results in shortened limbs, but a near normal trunk among other features um, familiar from ancient Egyptian depictions of dwarfs, such as the protruding abdomen and the enlarged head. Now, our dwarf stood just under four feet tall, uh, but his legs were incredibly stunted, as well as twisted, so that the stance of this early dynastic dwarf figurine from Tel Farca is probably no exaggeration. He probably did stand that bow-legged. And while female dwarfs are much more common, among the pre-dynastic ivories, possibly due to their association with fertility and childbirth or ritual dancing. In the court of the first dynasty kings, it was male dwarves that were honored by burial amongst the retainers around the royal tombs and commemorated with high quality stela, showing that they were valued personal attendants as they would continue to be in the old kingdom. But there are already several indications that our dwarf was already a very highly valued companion. Foremost amongst them is the location of his grave, which was beneath the floor of the funerary chapel appended to the tomb. Now, burial here seems to be an incredible honor, associating the dwarf intimately with the owner of tomb 16 in death, as he no doubt was in life. This possible portrait further suggests recognition of the dwarf. Now, although it was found on the surface, this remarkable piece may well represent our dwarf with his bowed legs and his short little arms. And this is the only flint figurine in human form known to me. And the care with which the stone has been chosen to provide him with the sash across the abdomen and a little kilt is really quite remarkable. But perhaps the best indication of the special status of this dwarf is his age. At approximately 40 years of age, he is the oldest person in the tomb complex, although it must be noted that we have a very poor idea of the age of the owner of tomb 16, as so little skeletal material was recovered. However, from the other inhumations, we can get a pretty good idea of the demographic, and it is far from normal. No one is younger than eight, and no one else can be confidently aged over 30 years of age. The sample is still limited, but it strongly suggests that few, if any, of them died of natural causes. And indeed, they may have been specifically chosen for the honor of accompanying their Lord. And if this is true of the humans, it is certainly true for the majority of the animals, amongst which different levels of care and value are evident. As mentioned before, the outer rung of tombs is almost entirely inhabited by animals, the pride of place perhaps being held by the elephant. Now this 10-year-old male was found two meters down in a large tomb all of his own, wrapped in vast quantities of linen and matting. 
a radiocarbon date on his well-preserved bones prove that he is an old elephant. Um, he's got an age that is, works out just perfectly with our ceramic dating, the date we would have gotten from, um, from dating the pottery from the general um, complex. So this is the early Nagata II period, late Nagata I period. And additionally, analysis of his well-preserved gut contents indicates that he dined on acacia twigs, river plants, and had, more surprisingly for his final meal, he also had emmer wheat, both chaff and grains. Now, emmer wheat is people food, and this, is the kind, this is, was the main bulk food um, for the population. So it's quite amazing that you can be giving it to an elephant, especially when one considers that an animal of his size would have required over 100 pounds of this every day. So sustaining such a beast on such high quality food must have been an awesome display of power and wealth of its owner. And he was not alone. Similarly, the aurochs, or the wild cattle, it's also known, which as we have seen has long been a symbol of power. Um, this one was buried in his own tomb, which you can see in the center, and he also feasted on emigraines, but was mainly allowed to pasture. A radiocarbon date on its gut contents gives us a nearly identical date to the elephant and strongly suggests that both of them met their end at the same time. Now, although neither the elephant nor the aurochs show explicit evidence that these animals were sustained in captivity for some time is indicated by our hartebeest, who exhibited a healed fracture of a rib and a deformation of the jaw similar that to that seen amongst wild animals long held in captivity in zoos today. In addition, she was also three months pregnant. The articulating legs of the fetus recovered from the womb tissue, implying that breeding herds of what was becoming an increasingly rare breed and is now in fact extinct were being maintained at the site at this time. Likewise kept in breeding troops were the baboons, which are not native to the Nile Valley and probably were brought in either from the Sudan or from the Red Sea Hills. Healed fractures on the forearms are common to almost all of them, indicating that they were subjected probably to some kind of disciplinary violence. So that stick that that man is holding, he probably did beat that baboon with it. Um, but after these injuries were inflicted, the animals were then nursed back to health over the course of at least six weeks, which is the time it takes for the bones to knit, to heal. After that, we cannot tell how long they were survived and were kept in captivity. Acquired closer to home was a four-month-old hippopotamus. Now, although its tomb was badly disturbed, almost the entire skeleton was recovered. And amongst the bones, a healed fracture on the lower leg indicates that this young hippo was probably tied to a tree and held in captivity for several weeks before its death, breaking its own leg as it strained to get free. Now, as we've seen from Stan, the hippo hunt was a symbolic act of great bravery. And hippos being protective, ferociously protective mothers, the live capture of a baby hippo must have been recognized as even a greater feat, especially to judge from the trouble taken on some depictions to add the offspring, to add the babies either born or unborn. So although it was a small, animal that we have in the cemetery, it was packed with um, lots of meaning. Also from the river came the crocodile, here shown in compressed form, but originally about two meters long, uh, with a fine collection of sharp teeth, although we have little to show what he might have eaten with them. Now these reptiles have a reputation uh, for withstanding starvation for up to six months, so it may have been good policy to feed the crocodile as little as possible, since the weaker he got, the easier he would have been to handle. Unfortunately, severe plundering has made it impossible to determine how an animal of this size was folded up to fit into his fairly small tomb. And it also leaves open the question of whether it was buried with the bundles of linen which, contains cos which contained cosmetics, so um, we have uh, green malachite and red ochre in these um, linen bundles, 
that were found near the tomb. We also have a collection of mud beads that were also found almost directly above the tomb. Now, we can't be sure because of plundering whether they belong to this tomb. However, I think you would have to starve the crocodile for a very long time before you could try to play dress up with it. Um, so this may have been, what, so potentially these may just be votive objects um, uh, given later rather than your, your dress up kit for your crocodile. In fact, the only unambiguous evidence we have for actually giving gifts to the animals are these two pots that were found in situ within the burial of three dogs. Now, dogs are by far the best represented species in the cemetery. We have 25 specimens in seven different graves, and most of them were fairly large, high-quality animals. Interspersed around the complex, they may have served as hunters, herders, or controllers, of the other animals, and especially the wild animals in the second rung, um, which can be considered statements on the power of their owner. But the dogs probably also herded the domestic animals, which inhabited the outer margins, which appear to be expressions of his ostentation and excess. Now the sacrifice, the sacrifice of valuable assets is visible in the burial of one old bull who was given a large tomb of his own, as well as the tomb containing the cow with her calf between her legs. But these are nothing compared to tomb 49. The excavation of about only one third of this long trench-like tomb in 2011 revealed eight cattle, buried whole and unbutchered, all under two years of age, and thus prime food. Since the tomb measured about 45 feet long, we estimated that this tomb could have contained about 20 heads of cattle, a huge uh, expenditure of resource. But when we returned to excavate this, the rest of this tomb this season, we found the sadly disturbed remains of four more cattle, but the rest of the tomb was empty. So whether somebody promised more than they could deliver, or it was meant to be added to over time, or simply that somebody's excavated it before us remains unclear, but it was a lot of work for not very much pay. Um, also unclear is to whom these 12 cattle, still not an insignificant number of cattle, it's still unclear exactly who they belong to. They could be part of the Tomb 16 complex, or just as easily part of a complex, another complex to the south, since, as we now know, the owner of Tomb 16 wasn't the only one to say it with animals. During our 2012 season, which, as I said, just ended six weeks ago, we investigated a set of tombs due east of Tomb 16, which appears to belong to a completely different complex, probably just a little later in time, uh, perhaps maybe just a generation later is all. Now, conclusions about this new area must remain preliminary, as we have not yet been able to find the main burial. Though I do have a pretty good idea where it is. Actually, it could be one of two places. It's either here, uh, where we have this massive crater, indicating that we will certainly not be the first one to examine it, or here, which is under our back dirt pile, proving that archaeological truism, that wherever you put your dirt, you will have to move it. Whatever the case, we certainly have our work cut out for us. But so far, we've been able to examine 10 graves in this new complex, revealing a reassuring range of similarities, but also an increase in an intriguing range of differences. We were initially led to this spot by the chance discovery of this tomb, whose occupant left us clear indications of his identity. In fact, we were able to recover all 18 of the claws and more of this large male leopard. A particularly fine specimen, I have been informed he is even larger than the one shown here, which is already billed on the internet as a leopard of exceptional size. Now the prowess of the le leopard was well recognized in the art of the later pre-dynastic period, and such a specimen must have been an incredible trophy especially considering the significance that the leopard skin probably already had, being a badge of office and of bravery at this time. 
keeping the leopard company. The other animals in the area include a troop of six baboons, and another oryx who left behind this rather keen oryx-shaped hole, another crocodile, and the remains of a young ostrich, the only actual bones of this bird to be known from pre-dynastic Upper Egypt. So despite the number of times the ostrich is depicted in art, we have very few, we have none until now, actual physical remains of, of ostriches other than their eggs. But the really big surprise of this season came from the domestic animals as well as the human graves. The excavation of tomb 51 in the center rewarded us with another dwarf, which is perhaps not entirely coincidental given the later evidence of dwarves as the tenders of animals, um, animal carers, things like that. Here we, have, we see dwarves with uh, both a leopard and monkeys. Now this new dwarf from, our, from tomb 51 is about four inches taller than the one we had previously, but equally as twisted, if not more so. And when you consider the occurrence of dwarves is only about one in approximately 30,000 births, the presence of two dwarves in the cemetery is quite remarkable and suggests that they are either importing them, like the exotic animals, or that these two dwarves are related, since the offspring of dwarves, and there's a 50% chance of dwarfism. So should we ever been al be allowed to do DNA studies in Egypt, it would be really fascinating to determine the relationship between these two dwarves, as well as their relationship um, to the adult female and two children also found in tomb 51. A further revelation was waiting for us amongst the domestic animals which so far is composed entirely of sheep. And this is the first time we have found sheep in the cemetery. Six were carefully laid out in this tomb and two more in two others. The preservation of the actual horn shows that they belong to the corkscrew horn variety known from Old Kingdom agricultural scenes. But these sheep are remarkably rare in pre-dynastic art, probably because they were relatively scarce in Upper Egypt where they're outnumbered by goats uh, by more than three to one amongst the settlement remains that we have. Much more common in the north, they are among the prizes gathered up on the so-called Libya tribute palette. But their relative rarity is only one of several reasons to suggest that our sheep are more than just mutton chops for the next life. All are extremely large specimens um, standing nearly three feet tall at the shoulder. But even more suggestive is the modification of their horns, so that instead of coming out of the sides of the heads, as is normal, and as you see here, in two cases, the horns have been trained to point straight up. So they look something like the drawing um, provided. Now the modification of cow horns is attested from ancient Egypt, and that's not a problem. But the modification of sheep horns, this is the first time we've ever seen anything like this. And the reasons for doing so remain unclear. One possibility is that it, perhaps it made the horns easier to decorate, since the sheep buried in this tomb definitely had been adorned with little tassels of fabric and delicately woven leather, um, which was quite a surprise to have a decorated sheep. Um, a somewhat similar practice is seen at Kerma in, uh, in Sudan, but this is dated 2,000 years later, um, where sheep were bedecked with ostrich feathers and beaded leather tassels prior to their burial in the elite tombs. Now, while I do not mean to imply that there is any connection between these two, these modified sheep alert us to the possibility that all of the animals in the cemetery had specific meaning and attendant rituals to go with them. They also warn us against considering these animals simply as exotica, uh, meant only to astound and amuse, though certainly awe no doubt played a large part in the whole display. And you can imagine the cemetery, the burial of these local rulers with all these animals 
really must have been awesome. Of course, without the text, um, the, the individual explanations for the wide variety of animals in just these two complex, of course, will remain difficult to grasp. But collectively, the animals no doubt had a protective, generally protective function against the natural chaos they represented in the cosmic sense of the world. Yet the burial of the large and exotic wild animals probably represents more than anything else, power. And power not simply to kill them, but power to control them and thereby become them, taking their natural physical power for one's own. And in this way, these burials in this cemetery show the physical reality behind the royal iconography of the early dynastic period. At its origin, it wasn't just symbolic, but involved the actual maintenance of these animals and a real display of mastery over them. And in the same way, we can view the decorated ivory handles of the later pre-dynastic with their rows of animals marching towards the sacrificial blade. These are not simply aspirational or metaphorical, but they harken back to a once known reality, potentially memorializing rituals, the remnants of which we can just begin to see here in the HK6 Cemetery at Hierakopolis. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, that was great. Uh, we want some very interesting, different, and larger numbers of animals next year. <laughs> now I'd like to move just for a few minutes, it won't be for very long, into the period that's probably more familiar to you, just to show you that many of these ideas that take root in the pre-dynastic that Stan and Renee presented continue on into the pharaonic period differently but the same, you'll see many, many pieces of iconography that you will recognize now that we've spent so much time looking at the pre-dynastic period. One of the goals of this exhibition, Dawn of Egyptian Art, was to bring to people's notice the complexity of pre-dynastic and early dynastic culture and how that culture that evolved over 1,500 years continued into the pharaonic period, and that you can see these same themes that were established in pre-dynastic and early dynastic Egypt in the time of the pharaohs, and that it really is a long period of continuity. It may not look exactly the same, but the themes are the same. You're not the only one who has trouble with the slide projector. One more try, and then I knock on the door. OK. I'm going to just do a very brief um, flow through the next 3,000 years of pharaonic history very quickly, um, showing you images that are, have to do with the desert and the Nile hunt, the hippo hunt and the desert animal hunts, and how those um, shift over time in their importance and who is involved in, that, in, in using these images. Because interestingly, it does change over time. Aha, there we go. So these two pieces, the hippo hunt jar from the Metropolitan, which is downstairs, and the desert um, hunt from the Ashmolean, which is also in the exhibition, cover these two um, uh, regions of the Nile Valley, the river, and the desert. Moving into the early dynastic period, that is dynasties one and two, as you remember, this is the beginning of the first pharaohs that are documented in Egyptian history. We may have had some in the late pre-dynastic, hard to tell, Narmer may have been a true pharaoh, but the ancient Egyptians start with Aha in dynasty one, and so that's where the line is drawn here. 
The two big sites from the early dynastic period are Saqqara, you recognize the steppe pyramid, and this is the uncovered tomb of Den at Abydos. There are some references to hunting in the early dynastic period. As you remember, Stan showed you a wonderful um, seal impression that, that showed Den harpooning a hippo. That's one. But here is another one. Why the hunt is represented on this amazing disc, you can see that it's been inlaid, and I show it because it's just a gorgeous piece of early dynastic art from the tomb of Hemaka at Saqqara, um, obviously a elite member of um, the royal household. You can see the dog tackling one of these antelope. And there's another one about to get a second. So it's a hunt scene. What this disc is for, we have no idea. It's still not something that anyone agrees on. But it can hardly be something that isn't ritually oriented. The amazing quality of the workmanship suggests such. If you look at the contents of various pharaoh's tombs, you find large numbers of arrowheads and arrows. And I wonder if that doesn't have something to do with this idea of ritual hunting. As, you, as Stan made quite clear, wild animals do not make up the game, or I'm sorry, do not make up the food sources in um, uh, pre-dynastic and early dynastic culture. It's domesticated animals. And it is not yet, um, hunting is not considered by Egyptologists to be a sport in these early periods. So it seems unlikely that's a reason. So you have arrows and there's a, har um, a spear. And also, one of these things that's just very interesting, totally odd, but again suggests the importance of wild animals, is a series of horns that have often been identified as rhino horns, although they're made from pottery and there were no rhinos left in Egypt. Um, this again suggests that you might, in looking around the contents of these early tombs, find pieces that refer to this early, um, to the ritual of, of, hunt, of desert hunting. At Saqqara, there is a new find, a relatively new find, that also suggests that this idea of hunting animals, in particular here, probably the hippo, is clearly connected to, to ritual interpretation and into very theoretical interpretation. At Saqqara, at the at the precinct of Djoser's step pyramid. Here is his step pyramid. There is a statue of King Djoser. Around his precinct, you can see there's the precinct, the funerary um, precinct, his tomb, and a whole uh, series of complex ritual buildings. There is what is being called a dry moat. It's basically um, a large channel that has been dug into the desert. And off this channel are a series of chambers. And one of these chambers, here's the chamber, it's called Corridor One, contained a buried, it's, in it was an under a, a group of animal bones and pottery, which might be from a slightly later date, the end of the sixth dynasty. Djoser is the third dynasty. There was a large case that contained a harpoon a massive harpoon, which was decorated with a snake, two sna I think two snakes. Now, I'm just bringing back to mind the, the um, discussion that Stan gave you of harpooning hippos, and he had that wonderful um, early image of a man with the harpoon. And the current interpretation of this dry moat with its various interesting little pockets of um, uh, different sized rooms containing odd elements of things is that they are ritually oriented. And, and they're interpreting it now as a way for the king to travel from his tomb, which was in the steppe pyramid, along this moat as he traveled through the underworld to get to the afterlife. And any of you that know about later um, uh, mythology in ancient Egypt know that, that that time period from when you died until you were reborn in the afterlife was a very dangerous one. It was one in which you met many enemies of the sun. And for a king, it was the most dangerous time of all. And 
the suggestion is that this buried harpoon has to do with harpooning the enemies of the sun god in, in this um, time period in which the king is moving towards the afterlife. And this would bring the same kind of ritual that we see in the pre-dynastic period into a sort of more theoretical frame of reference by the Old Kingdom and by early on in the Old Kingdom. By the second half of the Old Kingdom, the desert hunt is quite well known from Sahare's temple at Abu Sir. And here is a picture, uh, uh, a photograph of this relief. Here is the entire relief in line drawing. You can see the king is depicted as the hunter in this one, can, killing these animals in the desert. And here's a close-up. And what has always been discussed in this, besides the fact that it is a masterpiece of Old Kingdom art, both that the relief is done in different levels. The king is the, has the highest um, relief carving. He is the biggest figure, so he is the most important figure. And the desert animals that are being killed are, have the next level of height in the relief. And then the other details are even shallower, so that it is a very complex carving is the violence here to these animals. That this is a real hunt. A real hunt probably in theory, but where the king is the hunter and probably equated with Horus, the god, where he is dominating this area that is considered chaotic, the desert, where these animals are associated by the pharaonic period with this idea of disorder. And in a time period in which you see this evolution of this theme of mat, the idea of universal um, order, control, the way the world should function. Anything that works against that needs to be controlled. And the Egyptians saw the desert as a very chaotic place. It was harsh climate. It was full of animals that bounded in different directions that were often very large and could be potentially dangerous. The same with the river, where the crocodile and the hippo in the same way are very large and dangerous animals that must be controlled. When you look at other, other chapels um, from this end of the Old Kingdom, when you look at the elite members of, royal, of, of the king, the people that composed his court, you do see these hunt scenes, but they don't tend to be in the same intensity as that of Sahare. You see animals being hunted, but you also see them in nature. Among the hunted animals are animals giving birth animals mating. And it's much more of an idea um, associated with the replication of the world as well as controlling the world. And in these, especially in the earlier part, the nobleman is not the hunter. He does not take part in these scenes. Oh, and I should back up just so that you can see. Here is the desert hunt scene in the tomb of Akhethotep and his son Tahotep. And I do want to draw your attention to a close-up of some of the scenes. You can see the mating scenes as well as the hunting scenes. And if you go downstairs to the dawn of Egyptian art, you can see these same themes in objects there. There are the, is the dog attacking the ungulate, here a red deer, just like you see here. And you can see the mating hippos in this wonderful fragment of a jar from the pre-dynastic period. From Ram Kai, a chapel that we have over in our gallery 102, you can see, again, another one of these hunt scenes where it is not the tomb owner that is bringing the ibex under control to bring them back to um, be fattened up and later slaughtered, just like Stan was talking about lassoing them and making them come back. Here are the dogs, and another dog has got another gazelle over here. But not everybody in the scene is being hunted. So there's this level of nature that you often see in this late Old Kingdom desert hunt scenes. Hippo scenes, again, this one from T, you can see that it is his staff his servants that are hunting the hippos. He is simply observing. He has stepped away from the scene. But once you move into the early part of the Middle Kingdom, you continue to see these hunt scenes, such in this tomb of Amenemhet, 
There are the hunters. And here you see the netting because the way that the hunt seems to have worked, both in the pre-dynastic and in this time period, is that the animals were driven into areas where you put up netting, and so you caught them in the netting, and that made them much easier to kill or to capture. Again, in Amenemhat, you see the tomb owner simply observing the hunt. But when you go out, from the, out into the provenance uh, provincial part of Egypt in the early part of the Middle Kingdom. We're talking, you can see the dates, about 2000 BC. When you get to tomb chapels belonging to nobles that are really developing some power um, and controlling their own areas, you see a shift in what happens with the hunt scenes. These nobles begin to be the hunters as well. And so you see this in Ukhotep's tomb in the reign of Senwazrit, and you see it in Kanum Hotep as well. And Janice Cameron has, has written a very interesting um, book on how this whole tomb is basically a cosmology, a series of cosmologies in which ritual is integral to most of the scenes. And so what you're seeing is, although it is a desert hunt scene, it is a scene that has to do with control. Moving on from the Middle Kingdom into the Second Intermediate Period, and as you may know, this, this, the late Middle Kingdom and the Second Intermediate Period is a time period when centralized control is really not very strong. And there is a lot of interesting things going on in Egypt and a lot of innovation in the small art. And this wonderful set, there's a group of these bowls um, that are being studied by a colleague of mine, Susan Allen that have a lot of iconography that you would recognize from the pre-dynastic period. In the center, you have the tilapia fish, which you see all over the exhibit downstairs. And around the outer edge of this bowl, you see the hunt scene. Suggesting, and in some of these, I think you have hippos as well, suggesting that they are combining the two areas um, that have uh, associations with chaos and bringing them into a, a, a representations of control with decoration that is very reminiscent of the pre-dynastic period. Remember, just so you see, there's one of those jars with the hunt scene that Stan showed you, and there's a nilotic scene that is downstairs in the exhibition that belongs to the Met. Hunt scenes continue on into the New Kingdom, but now with a bit of a change because they have a change in the way that hunting is done. With the advent of chariots that come in from um, Asia Minor, you now hunt by horseback. And so instead of animals um, being chased into this netting, they are really completely fleeing. They're just gone. They're, everything goes in one direction. You also don't see so many of the different types of animals that we saw earlier, which is probably reflective of the fact that most of them are gone from Egypt, and they haven't seen them in a very long time. See the single direction that all of these animals take, which isn't what you saw in the Old Kingdom or earlier. And of course, one of the best known hunt scenes comes from the Temple of Ramses III at Medinat Habu. Many of you have seen these. And he hunts here bulls, the wild auric, probably what's left of them. They're almost probably pretty much gone there, too. Um, but again, he's hunting them, as I remember, from chariots. Yes. But it's not just the desert scene. In Tutankhamun's tomb, he has a statuette, in fact, I think it's a pair, that show him with the harpoon and the uh, attachment, remember, that Dan showed you? And he is probably symbolically hunting hippo. It's, he was, these statuettes were found in shrines, and so they're very much a cultic thing. It has, it has everything to do with probably chasing the enemies of the sun god during this time period in the underworld as you're moving from his death into eternal life. And I just wanted to finish up, of course, with the same, with one of the slides that Stan showed you, so you'll remember it. This is from the Temple of Edfu. Here we have Horus, the falcon-headed god, the king of all gods, followed by his mother Isis. And you can see he's harpooning a hippo. And that comes, that's based on a very, very famous story called The Contentions of Horus and Seth, where 
I'll read you just a clip from it that shows you that this whole concept of hunting hippos and controlling evil continues all the way through. For in the story, when they embarked upon their ships in the presence of the Aeneid, and Set, the god of evil and disorder, Set's ship sank in the water. So Set transformed himself into a hippo and scuttled Horus's ship. Horus then picked up his harpoon and hurled it into Set's body. And then the Aeneid, the group of gods, said, don't hurl at it anymore, and they settle it in another way. So you can see that the, the hunt of these wild animals is something that starts in the pre-dynastic, very early in the pre-dynastic, and has a ritual attached to it even at that time. And many of these rituals continue on into the pharaonic period. They evolve, they change, but the bottom line is they still are the control of wild animals that symbolize chaos and disorder and the Egyptians need to bring them under control so that their universe, their world, continues on in a very controlled way that makes the Egyptians feel comfortable. I hope you have a chance to go down and see Dawn of Egyptian Art if you haven't already looked at it. It's been delightful to have you as an audience today and thank you so much for coming.